All right, folks, it is 627 in the p.m. here on Friday, 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 January the 26th, 2024. The future is here. It is 2024. Wow. Still, it's still crazy to say that. I want to give a big shout out to Reverend Dale listening, watching on Facebook. You know, we all miss him here at the station, WLTH 1370 AM. Uh, before we left, we uh, paid tribute to a few people we lost. We paid tribute to uh, Cozy Weatherspoon, the uh, Calumet Township Assessor, and uh, Dexter King, the youngest son of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and... The late, great Marlena Shaw. We heard her uh, powerful, powerful California soul that's been sampled so many times. Her voice has been sampled so many times. That's just, that's how you know her voice is so enduring. Uh, so rest in peace to all of them. But as I talked about at the beginning of the show, we are getting new information every day seemingly about the effects of that our modern world are having on us. And uh, particularly about screens, about how much time we are spending in front of screens, computer screens, uh, smartphone screens, uh, TV screens, our screens are everywhere now. When I was a kid, still in the 80s and 90s, people were just uh, afraid of you being in front of the TV too much. Now it's the TV, the laptop, the phone, the watch. Everything is a screen now. And, I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by screens here right now. <laughs> I've got a one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, I got, I'm surrounded by seven screens as we speak here in the studio, um, screens have become a complete part of our way of life. And uh, a new article from the Epoch Times from uh, Marina T. Zhang has uh, shown that like a sudden unprecedented change in mental disorders is concerning scientists about the amount of usage that all of us, especially children, are are having with these phones. Excessive use of screens has become an epidemic, they're calling it, er, silently eroding lives with very little resistance. Gallup's 2012 survey found that around 60% of young adults admitted to spending too much time on the Internet. That is me. In a subsequent survey, 83% of smartphone users said that, <coughs> that they kept their phone near them almost at all times during their waking hours. Again, that is me. People that spend a lot of time on screens outside of work are typically enjoying short videos, film, and television, social media, or video games. That is me. <laughs> I don't even watch TV anymore. I just watch YouTube, basically. All of these screen-based forms of entertainment offer a similar emotional experience of novelty, discovery, and instant reward. This result is stressful and satisfying at the same time. Wow. The problem is that screens can over- stimulate our brains resulting in perpetual stress also known as the fight or flight state this state taxes the brain and body and makes us prone to meltdowns depression and anxiety when even minor changes in the environment occur wow this is incredible when you see people talking about the younger generations whether it's millennials or Zoomers in the workplace, and you hear so many people say, you know, these people are just not emotionally fit for work.
you have to wonder if it. a lot of that is because, the, especially with Zoomers, they've spent their entire lives in front of screens. I mean, at least when I was coming up in the 80s and 90s, like I said, we just had the TV to worry about. But if you weren't watching TV, you had to be doing something else. You know, we st- magazines were still a huge thing. You know, I was subscribed to Sports Illustrated. And, you know, my hip-hop magazine's the source and everything. So a lot of times I wouldn't even watch a TV. I was reading a magazine or, or reading a book to do my homework. But now, even to do your homework, you have to use screens to do your homework at school. And so basically, young people are in front of screens all day, every day. And Zoomers have never had a time in their lives where they are not in front of screens, ever. At least I lasted until I was about late in high school and into adulthood before screen started to really take over my life but and really become a thing. These kids from birth, these kids from birth are, are, are it's, it's like visual crack. These kids are being given visual crack basically from the day that they are born. This is uh, incredible. Uh, caller, hold on. Let me get through uh, some more of this, this article. The initial link between screen time and poor mental health was spotted through generational studies by Jean Twinge, who has a docu- doctorate in psychology and is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. Between 2005 and 2012, the change in rates of depressive episodes. Listen to this. Between 2005 and 2012, the change in rates of depressive episodes in teens aged 12 to 17 barely exceeded 1%. However, between 2012 and 2017, there's an almost 4% increase. Additionally, fewer teenagers are going outside and reading books while their time on social media and the Internet is dramatically surging. That is incredible. In 2008, psychotherapist Tom Kirsting, who had worked as a school counselor for 25 years, saw a rise in attention deficit disorder and (coughs) attention deficit hyperactivity disorder diagnosis in children over the age of 8. ADHD tends to be detected in early childhood after a child starts school. However, he has witnessed increasing diagnosis in teenagers and adults. While it could be possible that some of these teens were missed by clinicians when they were young, Mr. Kirsting says that some develop symptoms of ADHD due to screen use. Around 2012, when 30% of teenagers had a smartphone, he started to see rebellious behavior and anxiety disorders becoming more common among young children. Young adults and teenagers growing up now tend to be more antisocial and have reduced emotional resilience. Yes, it's just like the Bible says, weaker and wiser, weaker and wiser, which may be related to the insufficient in-person socializing due to spending most of their time behind screens. It's not just the amount of time spent in the cyber world, Mr. Kirsting told the Epoch Times, but also what they missed out on, outside play and social learning. How often do you see kids playing in in the streets here in the city of Gary now? How often do you see kids riding their bikes? I can't remember the last time I saw a kid riding his bike. Kids do not really ride bikes like that anymore. Me and my friends used to ride all over Miller on our bikes, and you just don't see that anymore. During the pandemic, adolescent screen time doubled. Few studies investigated internet addiction in children during the pandemic, 
but a large study done in adults in 2021 showed that adults who were considered at risk of internet addiction were two to three times more likely to have depression and 1.9 times more likely to have anxiety than the general population. Furthermore, people with definite or severe addiction were like 13 times more likely to have both depression and anxiety. Fast forward to post-pandemic times with teachers reporting from the, that the latest generation, Generation Alpha, known as iPad Kids, is aggressive, undisciplined, and regulates emotions poorly in the classroom. Wow. Dr. Clifford Sussman, a psychiatrist specializing in screen addiction, has focused his practice on treating this condition due to increasing lead, need, especially after the pandemic Demand for help with this issue has exploded, he told the Epoch Time. Let me get this caller. Hello, caller. Hey, brother Scott. Yes, yes. I'm enjoying the show. You know, I've read other articles talking about this thing with the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly as it relates to reading. Mm. And uh, the difference in how reading is in a, the brain when you do it in a book versus when you do it, say, on a Kindle platform or something like that. Right. And uh, that it really kind of negatively affects our ability to process Mm. because reading from a book is analog. Mm -hmm. And you have to go, you know, point by point by point. Right. Whereas with the screen... They have those links, and you can go yes, from do. this section, you click the link, it goes to something else, you click the link, it goes to something else, and before you know it, you've fallen down the rabbit hole. Yep. And yet, you know, they're convenient, they cost less. I bought a book just the other day on Kindle. If I'd have bought the hardcover book, it would have cost me $100. Whoa. It cost $22 on Kindle. Right. Now, isn't that just enticing you? Oh, yeah. To lean into that screen. (laughs) Yeah. So as much as I would want to say, you know, ban the screen, viva the book, (laughs) I have to admit, I'm as much drawn to the virtual library as any young person. Wow. Wow. Wow, they it's 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 so much more convenient, you know. Uh even yeah. be doing like research for this show and stuff, like you said, you go down the rabbit hole link after link after link after link. You know, sometimes yeah. I end up with ten or eleven different articles on one thing that I that I'm I'm studying. You know what I mean? And just think in with the books or newspapers, old school stuff. It would take it would take you hours to get all that sort of stuff together if you even knew that those other sources existed. Right. Absolutely. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should treat the screens the way we treat alcohol. You know. Mm. Maybe little little kids should be restricted to paper books until they get to the level mm. where they're competent with those. Of course, I've got an eight year old here that's already telling me no. She's already, no, no, give me my screen or give me that. (laughs) But, uh, man, it is, I guess it's one of those things, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to find ways to minimize the damage. Because, you know, once it's done, it's like AI. I mean, once you open the door to it, how do you go back? I know the Pandora's box is open. Yeah. Well, brother, as always, yeah. I enjoy listening. It's always good to talk to you. Yes. And we miss you guys as much as you all miss us. Yes, Rev. Look, call in any time. <laughs> all right, brother. All right, Blessings. Man. Love you. Love you too, Bye-bye. man. Yes, the Rev bringing some wisdom and clarity as as usual. Um. But I agree, I agree. I don't know what the answer to this is. I I, I really don't. Um, I, I I really don't. Uh, uh, 
because I'm trying to figure out how in my own life, you know, could I, what could I at this point live without screens? Like I said, I'm surrounded by seven screens as we speak. I'm surrounded by seven screens as I am talking to you. And I don't know if I could give you the same, <coughs> the same, uh, quality of show without the internet, without the amount of research into so many different places. I'd probably have to just like set up shop at a library and, and just keep looking through book after book. But you know, a lot of it is topical, you know, I'd have to buy four and five newspaper. I used to be a newspaper reader because everybody in my family are newspaper readers. Uh, when I was a kid, my father would, would buy the uh, Sun Times and the Post Tribune. Then my mother would read it. My brother would read it. And then I'd read it, uh, you know, when I came home from school. We were all newspaper readers. I haven't read a, a paper newspaper in years. When I want to get something from the, uh, the Hammond Times or Post Tribune, I go online and find it. Or the the Sun Times, these things are all on the internet now. Like it, it, it's really not like it's really not like you can uh, just completely delete yourself from. from the internet now it's uh it, it's very hard uh let me get back to this article though how screens hook you this is a good part screen activities whether they include video games social media internet scrolling or video streaming offer an escape these activities are also highly stimulating for the brain due to their bright colors and seamless integration into the virtual world medical professor and psycho psychotherapist Dr. David Rosenfield at Buenos Aires University told the Epoch Times. When presented with anything new and exciting, the brain releases dopamine and anything that induces dopamine or release can be addictive. Dopamine pr produces a feeling of pleasure while a drop of it, a drop in it, is linked to irritability and poor mood. Screen activities have been designed to capture our attention by feeding us regular doses of dopamine. Like playing an immersive video game giving you a thrill when you level up, level up, defeat a boss, or find a new item. Screens entice you to spend more time in the virtual world. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. I was a big gamer. I haven't played video games in many years. But I was a big gamer when I was young. You know, John Madden football and and NBA Live, NBA 2K, and NBA Street, and NBA Jam, and Mortal Kombat, and Street Fighter, and all this other stuff. Those games were very immersive. And I remember back then, you know, adults would tell us, you know, they're going to rot your brain. You just sit there playing <clears throat> playing your video games all day. It's going to rot your brain. You know, come to find out that they weren't too far off. Video games are governed by microscopic rules. Bennett fought it. Fadi, who teaches new game design at New York University's Game Center, said in the book Irresistible, The Rise of Addicted Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked by Adam Alter, as excerpted by The Guardian. These micro rules can be a ding sound or a white flash whenever there's a character moves over, whenever a character moves over a particular square and are synced to the player's actions so that they feel they were the one who caused it. The micro feedback generates a sense of reward. Hooking 
people into continuously playing the game. This system may also explain why interactive screen activities may be more problematic for children than passive screen activities like watching TV. Wow. Dr. Dunkley has observed that while two hours of TV is linked to signs of dysregulation in children, only 30 minutes of interactive screen activities is stimulating enough for signs to occur. So while it may take two hours of TV to dysregulate the thought process in your children, it only takes 30 minutes of interactive screen activities. Wow. Many video games also employ strategies used in game gambling, such as loot box rewards, where players are rewarded at random intervals throughout the game. Since players do not know when the next reward drop will come, they are further compelled to play the game, even if they are not enjoying it. I have been there. I have been there. Lord knows I have been there. This strategy came from the works of psychologist Burris Frederick Skinner. Skinner put pigeons in a box with a button, rewarding them with food whenever they pressed it. He found that the pigeons rewarded irregularly were more compelled to press the button than those rewarded with every button press. This compulsion also exists in humans. Social media posts break information into bite-sized pieces, feeding users a jolt of dopamine with, with every post, like, and comment. Furthermore, social media has been engineered to lack natural stopping cues inherent in many aspects of life. Whether it's a newspaper article, book, or movie, there's always an ending. One, therefore, left to choose another activity once the end of the article, chapter, or movie comes. However, with social media, one can scroll on forever. Without an end to the content known as the doom scroll. Internet surfing is no different. Put a word into the social the search engine and endless results and related links surface leading you down a rabbit hole. I have been there plenty of times. I'm not going to lie to you. I'll be up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on Twitter, doom scrolling. It's so easy to do. All you have to do is just keep scrolling. That's all you got to do. There's always a new piece of information out there. There's always somebody else who wants to argue. And then they want to wait till late at night and want to start arguing with you. And now you both are going at it. You know you have to get up in the morning. You got stuff to do. A lot of times you don't even know if the person you're arguing with it is even a real person. A lot of times they're not real people. A lot of times they are, are you know, bots. Created by somebody with an agenda. Now, what happens when screen time eats into human time? The social acceptability and pervasiveness of screens often make it hard for people to realize that their screen time may be getting out of control. So far, no consistent criteria on what counts as screen addiction exists. But there are there's increasing data suggesting that many Americans have problematic screen use. Americans spend seven hours a day 
behind screens on average, excluding time spent at work or school. Counselor Hillary Cash, the co-founder of Restart Life, a residential treatment center for tech addiction, told the Epoch Times that screen use is classified as problematic when it starts eating into time necessary for normal human functioning. Wow. People need around eight hours of sleep every day, and the average working time is 8.5 hours. They also need time to socialize, exercise, eat, shower, and manage daily affairs and hobbies. Seven hours of screen time daily would mean necessary activities are being sacrificed. Tell me about it. Dino Ambrosi, the founder of a 12-week program that helps college students limit social media time, estimated in a TEDx talk that if most 18-year-olds lived to be 90, they would have 334 months of free time left in their life. What those people do with this remaining time will quite literally determine the kind of person you will become. Yet, Mr. Ambrosi's estimation showed that around 93% of that time is spent behind screens, mostly unintentionally. Wow. Ms. Cash, who's programmed to treat people struggling with addiction to internet pornography and video games, began in the 1990s, has observed a warrior, a worrying trend. While her earlier clients also experienced major upheaval due to their screen addictions, they had sufficient life skills. In contrast, many of her clients to date lack necessary life skills. Wow. Such as knowing how to cook, maintain personal hygiene, hold down a conversation, make meaningful relationships, keep a job, etc., these people are more challenging to treat. One reason for this is that they were given a tool to escape early in their childhoods or adolescence. As a result, they have become chronic escapers of inconveniences and difficulties in life. Good Lord. Miss Cash said these people struggle to build social connections, navigate challenges, and hold down a job. All essential in helping a person construct a life outside the virtual world good lord i mean i i, I know i i know I'm, I'm falling all over myself here but this is scary this is out and out scary where we are at and especially what i'm hearing from people in different workplaces as they deal with young people Like this is this is this is definitely worrying when you consider that you have hundreds of millions of millennials and zoomers who are affected by this. And I, I, I don't know if there is a way out of this at this point. I don't know what the the way out of this at this point, because we've restructured our entire world around technology we've structured our entire world around it and so is there a way we're going to be able to to do this to be able to to somehow counteract <coughs> the effects of screen use. How are we going to be able to do this? Now, they are seeing four major mental disorders. Psychologists and professors Dar Daria Kuss and Mark Griffiths at Nottingham Trent University are some of the leading researchers investigating the effects of problematic screen use. 
Among the 26 psychotherapists who treat people with internet addiction, who Ms. Kuss and Ms. Mr. Griffiths surveyed, some said their patients' mental health problems were undoubtedly caused by screen use. They didn't have social anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder prior to when they started playing. One psychotherapist reported. Dr. Sussman added that when combined with addiction, mental health problems are often untreatable before uh, first addressing the addiction. Depression. First and foremost, depression. Prolonged screen entertainment leads to protracted periods of dopamine release. That means one experiences a dopamine drop when quitting screen time. Low dopamine levels are linked with irritable mood and depression. With constant stimulation, the body eventually attempts to stabilize itself. by making the brain's pleasure pathways less sensitive. This means that to achieve the same high, a person must either increase how stimulating the content is or watch more. This could mean more graphic, intense, or violent content. Then when a person gets off the screen, this results in further disinterest and poor mood. Naturally, people who are less interested in less stimulating activities like inherent interpersonal pleasures. Screen use is associated with low melatonin release, which can disrupt sleep and is potentially linked to a variety of mood disorders, including depression. <clears throat> Secondly, you get anxiety and irritability. Being on the screen means a person is constantly distracted. Social media and internet scrolling break up a person's attention span as attention is diverted from one thing to the next. We find in our research a correlation between frequency of attention switching and stress. Researcher Gloria Mark, who has a doctorate in psychology, said in an interview on the podcast, Speaking of Psychology. The faster the attention switching occurs, the higher the stress, measured by heart rate monitors and self-reporting. Stimulation from screen also activates the fight or flight response and causes adrenaline to be released. This adrenaline rush comes with a sense of anxiety or great excitement. If this state continues to be triggered, a person may become adrenaline depleted, said pediatric occupational ther therapist Chris Rowan, a critic of the impact of technology on human development, behavior, and productivity. Adrenaline depletion can lead the body to release cortisol instead. Ms. Rowan said cortisol is a stress hormone linked with anxiety and major depressive disorders. Wow. Oh, my God. And finally, ADHD. A major disorder linked with screen misuse is ADHD. The brain is like a muscle that can be trained. Dr. Andrew Doan has said, an ophthalmologist specializing in public health, Problematic gaming and excessive personal technology use. Since screen entertainment is highly distracting, time on screens comes at the expense of the time. Please hold, caller. Time used to train a person's ability to sustain attention, which is required to complete a mentally challenging task, like finishing lengthy homework. Prolonged screen time is also associated with thinning of the prefrontal cortex, which is critical for compulsion control and logical thinking. This is what also makes people with ADHD have difficulty in completing tasks that they find uninteresting. Wow. My God. So this is what employers are talking about when they're talking about they can't get young people to stay on task 
This is what I keep hearing people saying. Let me get this caller really quick. Hello, caller. Well, hello there. What's up? Well, it was just a great, great conversation, by the way. Right. Um, yeah, the anxiety is going to raise cortisol levels too. You know, mm. not just, not just, yeah, yeah, and that's going to cause eventually heart heart conditions, heart problems. You know. Yeah. I mean, guaranteed cause heart problems. You know, like um. But anyway, yes, yeah, sir. That's a great subject. I appreciate the conversation. But thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I think a, a, a probably bigger problem would be the you know the radio frequencies, though. Trying to protect the body from it's not just the screen. Well, when you say the screen, what is it about the screen? What is it about the cell phone? It's the radio frequencies that cause. Excessive radio waves to cause damage to our, our like, uh, you know, our, our plasma, actually. Right. That's what it does. It causes problems with our plasma. And, um, but anyway, it's like, how do we protect ourselves from the radio frequency? That's, that's, that's the question I think you're talking about. Mm. Yes. Because, I mean, that's where... That's where the biological issue comes in to a negative. That's how it affects the body neg negatively, absolutely. Now, the engineers are supposed to protect us from that, you know, the like the radio towers, all that stuff. Right. Now, you, you, if you ever have your AM radio on and drive through certain towns or villages that have lots of, uh, you know, uh, cell towers and stuff, you'd be shocked how you, how you hear the radio frequencies change the way your radio can, you know, see the sound, the, the signal. Right. That affects your, your body the same way. Mm. I, I mean, you can't see the radio waves, but they're affecting us mm. in physiological ways. Wow. And, with, and what you're talking about is anxiety, a level, a, a, a heightened level of anxiety on a, Hour to hour basis, it's not good for you. It's like the fight or flight routine, mm. and after a while, it has to cause heart damage. Wow! It just has to. It's like how do we? How do? How do all so many Americans have uh, fatty liver syndrome? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's the we, we live on grains mm -hmm. that are become refined sugars, mm. right? Right, and then right. we don't we don't we don't really understand what the nutrient what we're supposed to be eating anyway because we we live at the grocery store off a of commercial right and they tell us how we're supposed to be mm. right hey when uh, President Obama got elected and Michelle was talking about how the kids should be eating mm. what did all the people do they gave her a hiss and a boo right right I remember that. The lady was giving you the perfect recipe for help, and people just shut her down. Right, right, right. They, oh, we don't want our kids. We don't want our uh, her don't control what our me. kids eat. Right. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell me what's good for me. Uh, um, the idea of of it turns out that that uh, um, certain cured meats, I mean, cured meats have a have a nitrate in them that actually. Pretty carcinogenic, right? And we all love it and bacon. And, and if you talk to guys about cutting down their bacon, they say, never happened, mm -hmm. right? But if you ask them, what, hey, man, have you ever tried marijuana? They go, wait a minute, who, who do you think you're talking to, right? I'm just saying, it, it's like we're, we have such a unrealistic way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. It's not healthy at all. I mean, we judge everybody, and then the things that really affect us, we kind of overlook. Right, right. I I, I agree. Thank you for your call. Thank you for hey, your yes, call. Man. Thanks for thanks for talking. It's all good. Uh, let's finish this up. This this segment up. Um, problematic screen use is not limited to children, said Mrs. Ruin, who has conducted over four hundred workshops on topics such as productivity addictions, technology overuse, 
media literacy programs, and school environmental design said that parents sometimes enable children to seek out screens. The work of educator and clinical psychologist Katherine Steiner Adair has shown that children are increasingly competing with screens for their parents' attention. Good Lord. Some children have reported feeling neglected because their parents are constantly checking their phones. Parents who are unaware or not in control of their own screen time may also struggle to set the screen time limits for their children. Some parents are now raising their children by using screens as babysitters, and we see this all the time. We see parents just sitting their kids in front of screens. It used to just be the TV. I don't want to. I don't want to do A, B, C, D. Let's sit the kids in front of the screen. Now, just give them a phone, which is even more dangerous. If the TV was alcohol, this the the phone is crack. This phenomenon is reflected in Generation Alpha. A common issue with these children is a lack of discipline, leaving parents stressed, and only screens can pacify them during their tantrums. Schools and workplaces going digital have also facilitated screen use. As entertainment is often a click away, Dr. Sussman has described the difficulty of cutting screen use in the current environment. It's like drinking water in a bar. Oh my God. When asked if people can recover from an addiction, Dr. Rosenfeld said that most, the most crucial factor is having a loving family that cares and is willing to do everything to help the person get better. Well, we don't have a whole lot of, of those these days. But what about the new family dynamic where parents are also addicted to their screens and therefore do not see their children's screen addiction as much of a problem? Wow. Uh, Dr. Rosenfeld said somberly that is not a situation a psychoanalyst can help with. Wow. Folks. Oh, man. We got to do better for this next generation. We cannot sit here and complain about young people not having work ethic, not having this, that, and the other, not being able to do this. When when they were kids, we sat them in front of these screens that are the closest thing to crack since crack. So if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, it's, it's very looking like you're going to have to do whatever it takes to try to limit the screen use for your children, for your grandchildren, and for yourselves. probably too late for me as you see the screens have fully enveloped me <laughs> the screens have fully enveloped me here at the studio but it's not too late for you you can still make it out and especially the children all right folks you stick with us when we get back we're gonna do the happy happies <laughs> 